Hey y'all, my name is Cam Buckner and this is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast, also known as the What If It's True Podcast, out on the Podcast Network. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Audible, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcast. I've got one story in this podcast, and if you wear a toupee, you better put your chin strap on it. If you wear dentures, you better glue them in. And don't be eating any popcorn or hot dogs while you're listening to this, because you might choke on it. Let's, let's, let's get into this story. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's a really good one. All right, here we go. This is an email I received from a fella who doesn't uh, want me to use his real name, but he's known by his family and friends as T-Roy. Here's what T-Roy writes. My father was born in 1925 to a family of 10 children. He was in the middle of the stair-step ages, seven boys and three girls. It was the time of the Great Depression, and the movie Grapes of Wrath could have been his story put to film. His father was a hard and defeated man who was taken to drink, leaving his family for weeks at a time alone and the older of the seven brothers were tasked with hunting and fishing to feed the family, and my grandmother would take in sewing jobs and any odd job to buy basic food needs. The family did okay after my grandfather died, and the boys were excellent hunters and gatherers. I tell this part to explain that my father grew up in the woods hunting, and by hunting, I don't mean sitting in a blind with deer feeders set on timers to get the deer train to gather at the right time, I'm talking about real hunting is what dad and his brothers did daily to provide food. Each boy left home in a different direction and would not return home without game, be it rabbit, squirrel, deer, even a hog. My father feared nothing and would frequently go out in the dark without a flashlight. He really feared nothing except one thing, or should I say one place. It wasn't until I was 17 or 18 that I found out he had a fear at all and exactly what that fear was. My father was 40 when I was born. I was what was referred to as a late runner. My sister was 16 and my brother was 12 when I came along. Always a hard worker and always trying to provide better for his family, my father managed to save money here and there and eventually opened a gas station. Then he opened a small grocery, followed by a trailer park and several rental properties, and then he ventured into cattle. He was good at everything he built, but he excelled in the cattle business. To say that he was my hero is an understatement, but to add to his legend, he was legally blind. He was declared legally blind at 10 years of age, and he was sent to the Texas School for the Blind in 1935 where he stayed for less than a year. He learned to read Braille, but he cheated because he could actually see the words. He explained his blindness as drinking a glass of milk and then holding the empty glass to your eyes and looking through the milky residue. But he managed to do everything he needed, and he even held a driver's license. Of course, his brother went and got that in his place. When I turned 16, I became his driver in his right hand. We would hit three livestock auctions per week on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. It was a Saturday auction that brought out my father's only fear. Dad bought a fine slaughter beef, and our deep freeze was running low, and it was time to fill it back up. Once loaded in the trailer, we started for the slaughterhouse in West Columbia. We traveled on Highway 35 between Angleton and West Columbia, hundreds of times, but on this day, the auction ran long and it was after dark. As we made the turn onto Highway 35 at Bailey's Prairie, my dad gasped as if he had seen something that scared him. I asked if he was okay. I was afraid he was having a heart attack, and the suddenness and intensity of the gasp surprised me. His eyes were wide but distant, as if he were seeing a memory and he barked at me loudly to turn back to FM 521. Farm to Market 521 travels south from Angleton Auction Barn to Brazoria. Highway 35 west from there 
The two roads don't exactly cross. You have to turn onto Highway 35 and then travel 200 yards to continue on FM 521. I made the turn west. Dad panicked and he had me make the turn south. It all happened so fast that after making a quick turn and pulling my heart back out of my throat, I started to pull over to check on Dad. Well, this seemed to really set him off and he angrily yelled at me, Drive, goddammit! I never questioned my father. He seemed to always be exact and right. But on this one, I was completely perplexed. I asked him why we were going away from the slaughterhouse. Were we going to take the beef to the slaughterhouse tomorrow? He cut me off and he said that we're going to the slaughterhouse by way of Brazoria. Well, this was ridiculous. That was adding an hour to our trip home. We delivered the beef and then made the now much longer trip home in silence and I just drove not knowing what was wrong or how to ask. And once inside the house, I sat silently at the dining table, which was where all business and talks took place. Dad broke the silence. He said, T, I'm real sorry I yelled at you back there, but I got scared. My jaw hit the floor and he took notice of my gasping expression. To me, that was like Superman saying, I'm not strong enough. It was then that he told me a story, and it explained everything. In late 1939, my older and younger brother and I made a deal with a cafe in West Columbia to provide them with bullfrogs. They were adding frog legs to their menu. Halfway between West Columbia and Angleton on Highway 35 is a big slough that the area folk call Middle Bayou. Our plan was to walk up the slough a mile or so and then fill our tote sacks with frogs. We had carbide headlamps that gave very basic dim light, but enough to see where you were stepping, but the dim light made frogs and snake eyes shine. They were enough. My older brother pulled his car off 35 into the ditch and we got our gear ready. He left his keys in the ignition and I asked him about it and he said there probably wouldn't be a car coming by the rest of the night and did we really want to risk losing the keys and trying to find them out there in the swamp? He had a good point so we left the car windows down and proceeded down the slough. We crossed three barbed wire fences and were hearing frogs croaking everywhere along with crickets and locusts. Just as we approached a fourth fence, maybe 10 or 15 yards from it, my older brother froze in step and my younger brother ran into me as I stopped suddenly. I asked my older brother Isaac why he stopped and he just pointed silently up ahead of us. In the low moonlight, I could see a wide silhouette of shoulders and a head slightly swaying across that fourth fence. The carbide light made this thing's eyes glow the color of amber. The eyes were ten inches apart, and they had to be eight feet off the ground. It was then that I noticed that the slough had gone silent. Hoyt, my younger brother, said, What the hell is that? Isaac turned to us and said, Shh, this is something real bad. It seemed like we were in a stare-down with this thing, and Isaac started pushing us back real slow. It kept slowly swaying back and forth until we had moved far enough back that the glow of its eyes were a faint glimmer. Isaac told Hoyt to turn around and slowly start walking back to the car, and then he told me to do the same slowly, but just as I turned, this thing let out a roar that scared us to death. If you mix the high trumpet of an elephant, the deep rumble of a male lion, and the bellow of a bull all at the same time, that's what it sounded like. I felt that sound all the way through my body. Panicked as we were, we continued to slowly walk back. It yelled at us again, and we heard the heavy thud and the sound of a barbed wire fence being stomped down, and at that time a second yell came from the opposite side of the slough, and that one was crashing toward us, and Isaac yelled for us to run. The creatures moved parallel to each other down both sides of the slough, and now they were screaming non-stop. I never ran that hard in my life, T. Isaac kept a hand on my back, 
as he got to the third fence. We hurried through the wires and got back to a hard run. That thing behind us had closed the distance quite a bit. When we got to the second fence, we could hear the one on the opposite bank moving closer, and the footfalls behind us were approaching. We got past that fence, and the brush had opened up, and we could finally run at full speed, but so could the creatures. The first fence came into view. This time, there was no stopping and pulling wires apart. Wyatt ran through it, tearing his shirt off, and Isaac and I dove over it. We all came up running in a mad sprint to the last tree line trying to get to the car. We crashed through the last bit of brush and we dove into the car. Whatever that thing was, it stopped just inside the tree line and it let out one final scream. Isaac had started the car. It was in gear and moving in seconds and he floored it back to Highway 35. None of us spoke a word about this until we got home. We dropped off shirtless and scratched up Hoyt, and then Isaac dropped me at home, and there was still not a word spoken by anyone. It was a long time before the three of us talked about any of it. In fact, T, you're the first person I've ever told the whole story to. As I wrote earlier, my dad wasn't afraid of the dark or anything else. But that night put a fear in him that lasted until he died. Many years later, in 1988, my group of friends loved to go out at night and get a good scare. It was a pastime for us. One of the kids had come home from basic training and was ready for a fun night out. I had an idea. There was a new residential development under construction near where my father and his brothers had their experience. The new subdivision was called the Bar X. A story had been told that when the Bar X was first being developed, there was a construction trailer sitting in the back of the property and they were having a hard time keeping night watchmen hired to stay there. Late at night, something would come up and bang on the trailer and turn things over. After several night watchmen had quit, the story had gotten around enough that they couldn't hire anyone to do the job, they closed off that section and removed the equipment, and it stayed closed for many years. This was all I needed to hear to put together my best scare ever for my friends. I would take my buddy and his girlfriend there, and I'd tell them the story my dad had relayed to me, and then I'd get them to walk down that dirt road and scare the bejesus out of them. No one knew where we were going except me. We piled into my mother's 1977 Ford LTD, which actually could sit six people comfortably, and I began to tell the tale. Within minutes, all their eyes were huge and their mouths gaped open, and not a sound being made as they listened. I pulled onto the road and announced somberly that we had just crossed over Middle Bayou. Yep. It was the same middle bayou that Dad had been run out of 50 years before. We pulled in and circled to the right and stopped at the opening of the dirt road. The guys jumped out and they wanted to show they weren't scared. They were showing off for the girls. Reluctantly, the girls followed along and we headed for the gate back into those woods. The moonlight gave the area an eerie feeling and I remember a strong wind at my back. I was in the back of the group and I would blast out a horrible scream as they walked to the gate. And everything was working great until as I inhaled to get out that roar, I became aware that there was something beside me just off the road in the darkness. In my peripheral, I saw movement in black on black. I froze in step and I turned to face the blackness, straining my eyes to see what had moved. The two brothers saw that I had stopped and came back to join me. I didn't notice them. I was leaning over, looking hard into that blackness, trying to make out whatever had moved. They asked me what I saw, and I told them something wasn't right and to go get the girls that we needed to leave. They could hear in my tone that the gag was over and something really was wrong. I heard the girls approaching. My buddy was leaning over my shoulder, looking into the dark with me. There's something right there, I said. 
Lifting my hand to point at the thing I was looking at, and the wind that had been blowing stopped like someone had turned off a fan. Everything went silent, and it was as if the earth stood still as death. A stale odor came out of those trees. Could have been a skunk, but it was worse. All of us smelled it, and the girls shooed their hands across their clenched noses, trying to wave the odor away. A black shape rose to its feet in a fluid motion. It hit its head on a limb, raising it up in the moonlight. For a second, it went still again, and we could all now see its shape, and then it turned and crashed away into the woods. We dashed for the car, and as we ran, we could hear it crashing through the brush behind the new cul-de-sac. As fast as I could, I got the car started and I fishtailed into the curve heading out over Middle Bayou Crossing. My headlights picked up the back half of this thing, having already crossed the road and heading back into the brush on our side. We saw its back covered in hair as it ran, and as we got parallel with it, it turned its head and roared at us. It was the same roar my father had described. We raced away and turned on to FM 521, and everyone started to whoop and holler at the Great Scare. That is what we had gone there for. But not me. I was thinking about my father and the real terror he must have felt that night all those years ago. We went back there the next morning, and the limb that the creature bumped his head on was seven feet eight inches off the ground. We measured it. The creature was taller than eight feet, but there were no tracks due to the leaves covering the ground and we didn't think to look for anything else. While we looked around, a thought was running through my mind. I had been so close to this thing while peering into the darkness the night before, trying to make out what I knew had caught my eye. It was so close, only a short reach and it would have had me. I'm a big man. This thing was three times my size. I would have not had a chance. When we got home, I told my father the story. He leaned back in his chair and took a long drag off a cigarette. I'm sorry you had to go through that, he said. It scared me enough to make me sick to my stomach when I think about it. How do you feel right now? Same as you, Dad, I said. T-Roy, you saw a wood booger. Don't ever talk about it to people. Folks will think you lost your mind. Just keep it to yourself. That was the last time we ever talked about it. These days, I don't care what people think about me. I know what I saw, and I know what my father and his brothers saw. You can believe whatever you want. Okay, guys, that's going to wrap it up one story in this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I got to get back to work, but this story was so good. I wanted to share it with you. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks.